Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so we're on Spaceship Earth, as Buckminster Fuller coined. And um, I think about that a lot. As an engineer and designer, you know, we only have one. It's a pretty special, precious little uh, globe that we're living on here. Imagine mini Earth, as Bucky did, the UN, all the world leaders, decision makers, looking out, and they would see Earth, and they would they would see war these days, they would see, fa um, they would see drought, fathom, they would see poverty. You know what else I think they'd see? I think they'd see a lot of cool technology, I think they'd see a lot of hope, I think they'd see a lot of caring people to have a vision for the future, that we're all in this together. So that brings us to my story about suits. I want to tell you a tale of three suits. They told me to give a new presentation, <laughs> so I brought you some new suits. Uh, I'm going to start on Earth. and. Um, this is the blue suit. But before we even get to the suits, as an engineering professor at MIT, we always have dual purposes. So I study motion. I study astronaut motion. I study human motion here on Earth. We're, we put wearable sensors about everywhere, and we track limbs and have great little sensors to look at this. Well, the blue suit, I call the gravity loading countermeasure suit. For Earth, the application is for little folks with cerebral palsy. I can't cure cerebral palsy, but if I can just help that little person take an extra, extra step, do a daily activity, I'll declare victory. So the next 10 year goal is to use our space developed technology to look at helping uh, muscle motor control and just uh, empower some folks with daily activities. Let them just be little kids and, and live happy lives. So whatever we can do as engineers to get there. So as I mentioned, it's called the gravity loading countermeasure suit. So let's go to space. We have astronauts living in space station right now for six months. And um, you lose one to 2% bone mineral density per month. Now who wants to go on my four year Mars mission? <laughs> the high school kids are still here. <laughs> so we, uh, we, that's, we're in the business of trying to counter, physiologically counter those effects. Muscle, you're gonna lose about 30% muscle mass, about 40% muscle strength loss but it's really the skeletal system we're worried about because of that great bone density loss. Well, we think maybe you can strap on a blue suit. It's a compression suit. It'll go around you. This is a, in the lab, one of my great graduate students, just running, exercising at 1G. It's called the moonwalker because I don't get to go to the moon very often, but a 1.6 body weight loading, we strap you up from the, from the rafters. Ah, uh -huh, no. It's really easy, you could all be marathon runners because you don't use very much oxygen in my contraptions. And uh, we work on exoskeletons because spacesuits are really expensive. I need Easton because his exoskeleton is gonna beat our designs. Um, this is a kind of lightweight carbon fiber springs. I love to study animals, kangaroos fascinate me. The energy return in their muscles is quite phenomenal. We put a gas mask on you to really see how much energy you're using. And I wanna design a system that can make you very efficient. So we do other simulations here. Partial gravity, again, going underwater. Not water's viscous, but I can get a really nice loading. This is a one sixth body weight loading. We're on the moon, you're running. It's actually loping. You get to Mars, again, biomechanically, it's, it's kind of a lope. It's great, you have big hang time. I was a basketball player in college, and you could slam dunk. I could only slam dunk on the moon and Mars. I don't have a ch And these um, one-handed push-ups, well, I don't recommend them at home. But when we're flying, actually, on NASA's, this is NASA's aircraft, parabolic flight. It's actually called the Vomit Comet. Um, it makes you nauseous, but there's nothing like weightlessness. We're flying this on a Martian parabola. So you go up to 40,000 feet, and you get weightless, and then you dive down to a 2G pullout. Really bad carnival ride, right? So you're floating one minute. We get about 20, 25 seconds to take data and do our gymnastics. Well, we're looking at... Motor control, can you adapt to a 1G Earth? We've evolved and developed and adapted to Earth very well. well. What if I put you in a new environment? We call these extreme environments. So now you're floating and guess what? You're not very coordinated. And you can really tell the difference between a veteran astronaut and a rookie astronaut. We, because they're rookies, you know. So we're kind of moving all over the place. That's the blue suit. I'm always inspired by, by visionaries, specifically artists. You might uh, recognize Duchamp. I bet you don't recognize the one on the right. That's when I want my wonderful graduate students in a spacesuit out in the Arizona desert because it's kind of Mars-like. So we had a night traverse. We're trying to learn about exploration of different environments. These are my lunar Apollo bloopers. No, that German 
That's da Jack Schmidt, the only scientist, the only yeah, geologist yeah, we ever sent to the moon. <laughs> so that's my challenge as a spacesuit designer. Make them more mobile, more flexible. That was great for 40 years ago, but we should do better, uh, you know, 40 years hence. In the middle, that's the current state of the art. That's NASA's current extravehicular mobility unit. Keeps them alive, it's the world's smallest spacecraft. It's awesome, it has all the systems on board, but it's not mobile. 140 kilos, mm, 300 pound spacesuit, not good if you wanna get some work done. It's okay in weightlessness, but it's a killer for the moon or Mars. So we think about uh, kind of changing the paradigm in design. In the current suit, the astronauts are getting hurt. Matter of fact, 26 astronauts have had to have shoulder surgery repair and Hubble, training. Now, they don't get hurt in space, they get hurt training, because you do 10 hours underwater training for every one hour you're gonna do extra vehicular activity when you're in the spacesuit outside the craft. So we'd like to solve that. Well, we'd like to design a suit within a suit, as you can see in the images. So we need to protect them. I need to protect them, but I still need to give them all the mobility. So that bling, brings me to the black suit or sleeve. It's hot off the press, this is a very current work. In order to protect the astronauts, so we know if they're close to uh, muscle injury that can't be repaired or needs surgery, well, we have to measure. So we're trying to measure it. So we've developed with our colleagues both at Harvard and um, in Italy these really high precision pressure sensors, um, E-gain sensors, what's embedded in this suit. Once we can measure the hot spots or the pressures, then hopefully we can actually come up with some design solutions for the padding and things like that as well. Project. This is one of my great graduate students, Allie. <clears throat> There's a little sound here. Go ahead. We for fun. Okay, it's really not a musical shirt, but that's cool. I mean, I'm inspired. Um, it's really to measure pressures. You might know this. Bobby McFerrin, Spontaneous Inventions. Thinking about my body. So, why Bobby McFerrin? Because jazz. So I'm inspired by improv and improvisation. How can jazz musicians do that? That's what I need to do as an engineer and designer. I need to put together all these different folks and we just need to create. So um, work to go, we don't have the, the musical suit down. We need to concentrate actually and make it useful for NASA to take those pressures. But it's a, it's a new system that can give them measurements they've never had before in the hopes of protecting astronauts in future. So that kind of leads to my third suit, my third story. I think there was a really great idea by Dr. Paul Webb well before its time. 1971, a prototype skin suit for NASA called the Space Activity Suit. Now that's mobility. And this is before Lycra and spandex. So he didn't have the materials that I get to play around with today. But a complete paradigm shift, not a gas pressurized 140 kilo balloon which, as I said, is the world's smallest spacecraft. It's fantastic, but you know, how can we do it? So Dr. Paul Webb had this idea. Now there's a little part coming up here I want you to see. He can't dress himself. This is six layers of elastic material. You don't have a lot of spare buddies up in space, and so you really do need to dress yourself, and you can't take a couple hours getting dressed. So NASA said, thumbs down, a little too radical. Well, you know, but it's always good. I'm a researcher, so you, do, you look back and see what's done and said, I think that's a great idea, uh, kind of before its time. What can we do, you know, in 2000 to make this a reality? So um, if you've seen me today, you might see I have this Google Glass on. Um, I'm a novice. My students know how to use them much better than I do, and they're not too useful yet. But what's the, what's the life in the Martian astronaut going to be like? We think it'll be hopefully like this, a very tight-fitting second skin suit, all the information, a lot of information I need, beamed up when I'm at Mars exploring. Olympus Mons on Mars? Now that's a mountain. Mount Everest, puny. Um, Valles Marineris, nice. It would stretch across the whole US, right? Grand Canyon kind of shrinks. So we have some extreme exploration to do when we send people to Mars. What's read in my top blog, Top of, top of maps, this is what I'd be seeing in my, in my glass now. That's really important, because I've hit 20, 20 degree slope. People can go up 20, 40, almost 60, 
rovers can't yet today. I don't want to lose my rover in one of the craters as I'm going out to explore. So we have teams of people and rovers, and these are simulations, and we calculate how much oxygen, oxygen consumption, distance. What if something goes wrong and I need to get back, safe haven, back to my home? So we do all those kind of calculations, if you will, and we think we will absolutely just do it with um, synthetic enhanced vision. So to tell you, this is the MIT colored suit. <laughs> There's some white, picture, white suit pictures. This is a mock-up version three and mock-up version uh, four up there. So great idea before it's time. As I said, mechanical counterpressure, shrink wrapping the astronauts. I need to put a third of an atmosphere, 30 kilopascals on to keep you alive in a vacuum. So it's a pressure garment, it's a pressure suit. Hmm, good idea. We have new materials today. What am I showing? If you move your arms and legs, I want full mobility. And you drew a whole bunch of little circles all over your skin, and you move. Skin stretches, right? Well, you'd see if those circles would turn into an ellipse. Those red lines, the two bisecting diameters, they're just going to pivot. There's a set of those bisecting diameters that are just going to pivot. Aha, fantastic. So I do a three-dimensional. Euler analysis on the eigenvector calculations. Zoom, we get a Spider-Man suit. So um, it was, again, credit where credit's due. Iberal, the image here on the left that the animation is coming out, Iberal thought of this graphically, but we just did the mathematical analysis to prove maybe we can come up with this patterning. We call it, so the patterning is lines of non-extension. So now they're red on this suit that you're looking at here, those lines of non-extension, that's really important because I want to give you maximum mobility, but I got to keep you alive and it needs to be a pressure producing suit as well. So now we kind of have it. We have basically maximum mobility and minimize your energy consumption because I don't want you wasting all of your energy um, to fight the suit. That's what happens now. About 75% of your energy you're wasting to overcome the stiff pressurized suit. No, I need you to be an explorer, an extreme explorer. So I have to kind of um, switch that paradigm and have all of your energy going into um, successful exploration. And that leads me to um, what we're doing now. Uh, we're looking at some advanced materials because I can get about 20 kilopascals, two-tenths of an atmosphere, pressure production, but I, but I said I needed a third of an atmosphere, 30 kilopascals. So how can I get that extra five or 10 kilopascals? I think it's inactive materials. This is a work of, of colleagues at MIT, electrospin lacing. Very cool technology, because I know what polymers I want. We know the material properties, and I know exactly how much pressure and the, uh, pressure and the patterning I want on your arms and legs, but I gotta go to some really smart material science friends to, to kind of make them. So they're making them in 3D now. I can say, you know, spin, electro spin spray, this polymer is just not stable in three dimensions yet, but it's great research. We think it'll be there soon. Here's some of uh, the two top technologies we're looking at to embed, basically, I think of these as smart zippers, if you will, in the bio suit. Um, dielectric elastomers, very cool, beautiful aesthetic. The one on the top, kind of morphing wing type of, of technology is coming a long way. On the middle and the bottom, that's shape memory alloys. You might have heard of it as muscle wire. Nickel titanium is biphasic, so it can have the little happy face, or it can have another face. So Here's a demonstration. Remember those Chinese finger traps you used to play with when you were a kid? They produce a lot of compression, I was noticing. So now we make them out of uh, kind of these active materials, these SMA, sharp memory, shape memory alloys, and we can get that extra, that extra pressure that I need um, to combine in the, in the bio suit to really make sure that people are safe, pressurized, and happy, and very flexible for their Martian experience. So this is kind of a shout out to um, the students. I've, uh, wearing these Google glasses that, again, like I said, are, have some design flaws. I'm left-handed, so I kind of need it on my left eye because I keep close. <laughs> I'm left eye dominant. <laughs> I also have hair. I'm a woman, <laughs> so they kind of get in the way. But the great thing is they're student magnets. I've been wearing these around, and I've met a whole bunch of high school students today. <laughs> and that's great <laughs> because I'm recruiting all of them. Um, people like our suit. Uh, again, uh, credit to, to my partner and... Uh, uh, Guy Trotti, who works with me on most of these projects, uh, kind of soulmates and, and team, and Mickey Ackerman, who invited me to, to speak here today as well, because uh, what we're all about is, is education, and uh, it's the future generations that, that I care about, and uh, everyone's so talented, and we need every single one of you, um, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, uh, because we have big problems. We have big societal important problems to tackle, and so we've been really benefited 
get a lot of press, be in a lot of museums, and the great thing about that is I have little girls and boys come up to me out. They want to be astronauts, and Ping, I still want you to be an astronaut, and I have a suit for you, <laughs> and, and we'll see what we can, we'll see, and, and Easton has got to come and work on the exoskeleton with me, and I like those pink shoes, we, we can work on that, we can pressure production. <laughs> and uh, I will leave you uh, with a couple minute video. If you haven't seen this, I think it's worth a watch. Spaceship Earth, that's the atmosphere, that green line. If we shrunk Earth to a basketball, it's three hairs thick. That's our life support system on Earth. So we have to take care of the Earth. We have to take care of each other. And uh, thanks to NASA and Peter Gabriel for this image. Um, that's what we see from space. And it's a pretty incredible way to look at the world. And you know, we are all very connected. Every, every 90 minutes, we make one circle around Earth. And the auroras are beautiful. I'm a kid from Montana. So I got to see the northern stars growing up, but there's nothing like seeing the aurora borealis, southern and northern, northern from space. It's only 200 miles up, 400 kilometers. Boston to New York, that's where we're living in space now. It's low Earth orbit, and it's fantastic, and it's great, but it's been 40 years since we've been to another planetary body, and um, I think with all my great students and, and all the great dreamers in the world, we'll, we'll get to the moon, we'll get to Mars, and uh, we're going for the search of, of life, and it'll be humans and, and rovers and robots all working together. Scientific benefit will be great, but the most important thing is that we learn about ourselves. It's in the reflection and uh, thinking about who we are and who humanity is. So thank you for your attention, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>